Here at Flight Insight, we always like to think of our plan B. So let's plan an IFR flight here in the Mid-Atlantic to talk about alternates. We're going to depart College Park Airport in Maryland and head for Ocean City on the South Jersey Shore. With the direct route, it's 110 nautical miles, and our Cessna doing 100 knots should make that distance in 66 minutes. How much fuel do we legally need to have on board? You might remember VFR fuel minimums from private training, and IFR fuel requirements aren't too much different. FAR 91.167A is what we're looking for to know this. It says that we have to have enough fuel to go to our destination airport, then our alternate airport, then an additional 45 minutes of flight at cruise speed. It's very similar to the nighttime VFR minimums, except for this addition of an alternate, which we don't see in VFR cross-country fuel planning. So what is an alternate? It's a plan B if for whatever reason we can't land at our intended destination. It could very likely be because the weather is too poor to even make an instrument landing there. There's a much bigger chance of this happening under IFR, so we have this added requirement for an alternate. So we're able to add an alternate airport into our flight plan. We don't always have to go to our alternate. Once we're up in the air, the decision of where to divert is up to us, and we're not held to going to whatever airport we listed on our flight plan. Do we even need to file an alternate? If our destination airport doesn't have an instrument approach, we do. But what about if, like at Ocean City, there are usable instrument approaches? Then it depends on the weather forecast at our destination. The same FAR we referenced before says that no alternate is needed if, either one hour before or after our estimated time of arrival at the destination, the weather forecast there shows a ceiling of at least 2,000 feet AGL, and a forecast visibility of three statute miles or more. You'll hear this referred to as the one, two, three rule, and this is a great way to remember the requirement. So we check a TAF near Ocean City and see this report. Let's say our planned arrival time is 0200 Zulu, so this TAF is valid at our exact ETA. That satisfies the one in our one, two, three rule. It's showing visibility better than six statute miles, which satisfies the three in the one, two, three rule. Also, the ceiling is forecast to be broken at 4,000 feet, a bit low, but it satisfies the two in the one, two, three rule. All three conditions being met, we are okay to skip filing an alternate if we don't want to. So now let's figure out our fuel requirements without the alternate. The time to our destination at Ocean City is 66 minutes as shown on the map. We also need a 45 minute reserve per the regulation. There's no alternate, so we add just these two up to get our total time of 111 minutes or 1.85 hours. To make it simple, let's say we burn 10 gallons an hour. At that rate, we'll burn 18.5 gallons in this time. So this is the legal minimum for this IFR flight. Now let's say we check the weather and see this. This is a temporary change to the issued forecast. Its period is from 00 Zulu to 0100 Zulu, so it applies to one hour before our intended arrival. This satisfies the one in the 123 rule. Next, the five statute miles is more than the required three, so it satisfies the three in the 123 rule. The ceilings are low, though, broken 900 feet, well below the required 2,000 feet, so we fail the two in the 123 rule. All it takes is one ding and the whole test has failed, so we do require an alternate given these forecast conditions. And for good reason. With ceilings this low at the destination, it makes very good sense to have a plan B airport. So where to divert to as an alternate? Remember, we won't be held to going to this airport in flight, but because our alternate is going to be a factor in our fuel requirements, it can have an effect on our planning. Let's see how. Let's first choose Atlantic City as our alternate. It's not a terrible choice. It's a big Class C airport with a lot of different instrument approaches to rely on. Plus, it's very close to Ocean City, only 12 miles or 7 minutes in our Cessna. If we add those 7 minutes to our total calculation, we get 118 minutes or 1.97 hours, which is 19.7 gallons at our burn rate. Compared to our plan with no alternate, we'll now be carrying just over one additional gallon. It might not be wise to choose Atlantic City as our alternate, though. If the weather is too poor to land at Ocean City, the odds are decent that this weather might also be present at our alternate, making landing there tricky too. Another thing to keep in mind is that coastal areas tend to experience their own weather patterns. That's the Atlantic Ocean there to the east, and fog rolling in there can affect aerodromes up and down the coast. It might not be a bad idea to find an alternate more inland. So let's use Philadelphia International. 
another solid choice. Big airport, lots of air traffic control to help, plenty of approaches. It's a bit further though, 47 miles or an extra 30 minutes of flying. So let's see what that does to our fuel requirements. Adding this extra 30 minutes of flight gets us a total time of 141 minutes or 2.35 hours. We'll need 23.5 gallons of fuel with Philly as our alternate. So now we can compare all these scenarios and see how fuel factors into the decision on where to file our alternate if needed. Now the decision process we talked about can be mapped out like this to start building a complete picture of the part 91 IFR alternate requirements. The first thing we did was determine if our destination had an instrument approach. We said yes, so we moved on to the 123 rule. If we pass the 123 rule, we don't need an alternate. If we fail the 123 test or our destination doesn't have an approach, we're required to file an alternate. But we're far from done here. We have to figure out if and under what conditions we can use our intended airport as an alternate. The first question we have to ask is if the alternate itself has an instrument approach. Not all airports have instrument approaches. Here, Nemecolon in brown doesn't have one, while Cumberland in green does. If the alternate doesn't have an approach like Nemecolon, we can only use it if the forecast weather will allow us to descend in VFR conditions from our filed en route altitude and land. Makes sense. If there's no instrument approach, the only way you can land there is in visual conditions. If the airport does have an approach, like Cumberland does, we need to look at those approaches, starting with the one we're most likely to use if we divert there. So let's pull up an approach plate at Cumberland. This is the localizer DME approach to runway 23. In the notes, we see the reverse A symbol. This means that the minimum weather conditions required to use this as our alternate are non-standard, and we'd need to look them up in the terminal procedures publication. So we grab that document for this region and look in the section with the reverse A at the top of the page. Seeing Cumberland and the LOC 23 approach, we have two tick marks, one and four, which say, first of all, that for our category A Cessna, the weather minimums have to be at least 1,000 foot ceilings and two miles of visibility, or we can't use this approach in our alternate planning. We could still use the airport, but we'd have to look at another approach plate there to see if one qualified. Secondly, it says that the approach is NA, not allowed to be used as an alternate if the FBO is closed at the airport. That's kind of weird, right? The FBO staff aren't air traffic control, they're not even FAA or anything, so what does that have to do with our choice of alternate? Remember that the margins get stricter when you're talking about alternates. The rules are set up so that nothing should stop you from shooting that approach into your alternate because you're close to the end of your legal fuel requirement. Ground-based nav aid approaches like the localizer require monitoring to ensure they're still working. Big airports with round-the-clock personnel, the FAA typically handles this. But at smaller airports like Cumberland, there's usually just a signal to alert FBO staff that something is wrong with the equipment. They won't be able to fix it, but they can tell the FAA there's a problem and put in a call to the cable repair guy to come out and fix it. When the FBO is closed for the night, there's no one monitoring the equipment. Unmonitored navigate approaches are not allowed to be used for the purpose of alternate planning. So back to our decision boxes. If we look at the approach plate and see that reverse A, we then need to ask ourselves if the approach is even allowed to be used as an alternate. We'd either see that note in the TPP like we saw for Cumberland, or we'd see this symbol on the approach plate itself, ANA. If the approach plate says ANA, it means alternate not allowed. We see that here on the plate for the ILS at Winchester Regional. This is another smaller airport with a nav aid based approach, but this time no one's monitoring any time of day, so it's ANA. Again, doesn't mean we couldn't use Winchester as the alternate, we just have to find another approach that was suitable for the conditions and our airplane's equipment. It used to be that no GPS approaches were allowed to be used as alternates. The FAA changed that in 2013 and started allowing some GPS approaches, and more being added all the time. There are some GPS approaches that won't be allowed anytime soon though. As the AIM says in Chapter 1-1-18, GPS approaches to airports without weather reporting capabilities will still be classified as ANA. Here at Clearview, the GPS to 1-4 is listed as ANA because the local weather isn't at the field. It's at DMW, nearby Carroll County Airport. To be able to use a GPS approach in your alternate planning, there has to be local weather on that field available. 
So now we know that if we see that a and a, we can't use it as an alternate. If we don't see the a and a next to that reverse a, we're good to use the alternate as long as the weather meets the minimums in the TPP, like the ones we found for Cumberland. Okay, now we've gotten rid of all the non-standard stuff. Let's talk about the standard rules you need to know when selecting an alternate. If the approach plate doesn't have that reverse A in the notes at all, then we first need to ask if it's a precision or non-precision approach. Remember the definitions here. A precision approach is anything with horizontal and vertical guidance, typically an ILS. The FAA doesn't consider GPS approaches to be precision, even if you're flying an LPV, which has vertical guidance. If our approach is precision, we can use it as our alternate if the weather is at least 600 foot ceilings and two miles of visibility. If it's a non-precision approach, like any GPS approach, a localizer approach, a VOR approach or anything, the minimums are higher, 800 foot ceilings and two miles. So this is a lot of detail, and in typical Flight Insight style, we've over-explained what could be a simple topic for the sake of getting a deeper understanding. But here's the bulk of what you need to know. When we're planning an IFR flight under Part 91, we only need an alternate if the weather fails the 123 rule, and then we can only use our alternate if the weather is better than 602 with a precision approach or 802 with a non-precision approach. If you can remember these figures, you should be able to fill in the rest of the details. One last thing, all of this really only applies to our plan. So once we're in the air, things are more fluid. If we filed an alternate with an ILS, but find once we're about to actually shoot the approach that the weather is lower than 602, it doesn't mean we can't fly the approach. The same requirements apply as they would for any approach, as long as the weather minimums listed on the plate are met, we're good to go. If this was helpful, please click subscribe so that you could stay up to date on every new training video coming out each Tuesday and Friday and get access to posts and articles on the community page that'll take your training even further. It just takes one click and it's so worth it.